Okay, Mithras, ancient god of ancient Persia. The area of Mesopotamia all the way through the Persian area, what would have been Siam and leading into India. He was seen as the successor to the Akkadian Age and the Phoenician Age that he showed up. Down here in the bottom right hand corner he's wearing one of those Phrygian caps. And interesting enough you can get a lot out of things. This is a fresco from 300 BC and so this is before Christ. But yet here is Mithras in the middle and what we're seeing depicted here in this picture is the fact that in his story he is uh, being baptized. Uh, this is th something they have. He's being cleansed and baptized in the water by the shepherd man in the skins over here at the right. That would be very much like John the Baptist. And over here on the left would have been the creator of all God. And he is telling people that this is his successor, that he is becoming heaven, and that the guy in the middle, who is the son, and his son, but he's also the son, and uh, that he is to be his successor, his son, his forebearer. You see him with a halo on. You see the dove descending which is a symbol of Inanna and in giving her virtue and in fact she imparts the waters that anoint the Christ who is Mithras. If you'll look at this he has 12 disciples around him in a circlet. These 12 disciples are very saint-like and they actually have different aspects to each one of them. And almost like Catholicism, you can use these guys in their teachings to help lead you to what the answer is with the one in the middle who directs everything to the Father. It sounds real familiar, and the iconography is real familiar. The problem that people are going to have with it is that it happened 300 B.C. or farther back. They find it all the way up until 300 B.C. or even after, through that, it keeps going. It's interesting to find the parallels that he actually has with Jesus Christ. Um, oddly enough, I found a clip that came from a game show over in the U.K., and it's one of those things where they give you a hint and keep going and give you a hint and give you a keep going. And of course, the first time that they gave him, gave him the, the things that go along with this guy, they chose Jesus. And then they were pretty much just dumbfounded after that. And so let's look at all the things that do go with this here real quick. Uh, this is again a, a, a game show from like the 80s, late 80s. India. There are amazing things claimed about Mithras, and I'll read you some of them. He was a savior, Mithras, sent to earth to live as a mortal, through whom it was possible for sinners to be reborn into an immortal life. He died for our sins, but came back to life the following Sunday. He was born of a virgin on December the 25th in a manger, or perhaps a cave, attended by shepherds, and became known as the light of the world. He had 12 disciples with whom he shared a last meal before dying. His devotees symbolically consumed the flesh and blood of him. Because Mithras was a sun god, he was worshipped on Sundays. Is he a tribute band? He was infected with a halo around his head. Oh. And Mithras gave each other gifts on December the 25th. The leader of the religion was called the Papa, and uh, HQ was on Vatican Hill in Rome. And you're not you're kind of riding up the chapel, it's just, it's just a massive coincidence. <laughs> Yeah, just a massive coincidence, yeah. Yeah, just a massive coincidence. And you'd say that, well, they've got to be copying them and stuff and everything. Yeah, yeah, you'd agree that somebody's copying somebody. When you find out Mithras is peaked at about 300 B.C. before any of the Christ things, and uh, 
it actually came out of the sun god Shamash and the Babylonian uh, aspects of things. It just really starts to, you know, make you wonder. It's from the Ahura Mazda strain and things. You can find that him and all, all through the Zoroastrianism and things like that, that people do try to equate that comes about. Um, and equates to being, you know, the, the bringer of that or where they must have just kifed most of it from. Surely they've got some difference. They go, uh-uh, we do, we do this, we, yeah, whatever. Uh, the basis of it, the rest of it, you know. And there are literally hundreds of accounts uh, that you can find that uh, really correlate Jesus as a reincarnation of Mithra that uh, the whole dogma that goes with it um, and everything is, you know, twisted, got a different flavor on it, but it's the same thing. It's like whenever you see somebody do a movie nowadays and you go, man, that's just like what you call it. It's what it is. And, and people, it is what it is, okay? But look at all these different types. There's just so many of these articles books and things that really just set him to be a clone and uh who was this this mithra you know let's let's look into this deeper well, mithra starts showing up in rome just right around the time of christ actually and uh, you know like the map that i showed and um, there are two different religions blended into one here that pull him as one. So this is Rome again, twisting their two to one thing, uh, like they did with the Greeks and so on. And, uh, there was this entity known as Saul Invictus. This is it, the god Saul Invictus, Dio Saul Invictus. And, uh, it means the, um, the ever or non-changing sun, the, um, the everlasting sun. There's a lot of ways to look at Invictus, but um, it's um, very strangely looks just like the entity that France gave us that we know as our Statue of Liberty. In fact, I'm of the belief that this right here, one of three statues really that are in Rome are the inspiration for what we get of our Statue of Liberty. And indeed, it does have an incredible resemblance to our Statue of Liberty, uh, down to the uh, amount of points on its head and, and things. Uh, of course, there's a few statues that have him with a different point count, but uh, we're just going to go with uh, seven here, which is the sacred number. And... Um, Definitely a Romanesque nose on this lady, even though she seems to come from France. But uh, it, it, it is a Roman depiction of a, a, a giant Roman statue. This is a, a something that is equal to the Colossus. And some of the things that were considered to be the seven wonders of the world at one time. And we've got it here on our shores, welcoming people as a beacon of new hope. And indeed... The Persian god Mithras, or Mithra is the Indians and Persians knew him, um, was the god of hope. And so let's look into this just a little more, this iconography we've been given to, so that we have symbolism, you know. Washington's full of symbolism and all kinds of Masonic things, and it lays out a pentagram and the compass and everything. But let's look at this statue a little bit. It looks incredibly like this statue found at Kalmar. Uh, almost looks like somebody tried to recreate it, but just really put a sad look on her eyes. The rest of it seems to be the same, or seems to have a wanting gaze, or something that gives ease to you, and this one looks very much at distress. And you know, I, I kind of get it here. Uh, yeah, I can... Definitely see the resemblance there. Um, yeah. In fact, ours even looks a little more flat-nosed Roman-esque, you know, than, than the Persian one. But uh, I guess that would be common, you know. Yeah. 
And it really rings true when you find other statues throughout over there where they're looking at this Mithras uh, deity and the bringer of light. That he's known as the bringer of light. Light, by the way, is equated to knowledge. And so that definitely is showing through right there. And it's this symbolism that you see a lot. And you know, America, man, the world needs her knowledge, uh, her light that she brings. And uh, girl, put that arm back up there. I know it gets a little tired, but uh, hey, they'll weld it in place, kind of like Moses over to have his staff held up at the big fight here. Let's let's get that arm back up. And you know, this grand lady liberty of ours, she doesn't ever take a break. You know, she doesn't lower that arm. She doesn't, uh, you know, just sit back and have that casualty. You know, uh, it's, it's about time for there to be some casualty, some, some, not casualty, that's a bad word. It's about time for there to be some satiated time of, and you know, she doesn't take a break. She doesn't ever, you know, lower her arm and, and uh, give that, that break. She's supposed to be a, a lighthouse and a beacon of light showing you know, back towards the rest of the world. Um, when the sun goes down, she's still there throwing the light back at them. Which, when the sun comes up on the other side of the world, they're getting it, and they bring it to us, and we throw it back around to them, and they bring it to us, and we throw it back around to them. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Yeah. It's about time we had a, a time of peace. It really is. You know, we all like our liberty and we all want our own liberty, you know, that we can call our own. You know, maybe it's time for mankind to kick it in high gear, you know, here and then you throw the other arm up, really get that enlightenment going there. Although, look at her crown, it's, it's even blowing her points back down. Uh, she's just caught in the wind. Uh, yeah, believe it or not, this is on the other side of a Taco Bell someplace. <laughs> I believe it's... Uh, I believe it's someplace down near San Antonio. So, uh, yeah, incredible. So, and her original face was meant to be more stern looking like this. And uh, really almost looks like a Elvis kind of mad, doesn't it? You see it? Yeah. But they changed it. Uh, something that's much more solemn and, and has distant eyes. And instead of a stern look, a little more caring and just a little bit less of Elvis there, baby. She was originally supposed to be something that was somehow mocking the Colossus of Rhodes. Uh, this picture on the left is a little incorrect. His legs actually sprouted across the duct that you came through. And so people were actually going through the legs of him or whatever. But uh, this is that same creature and en entity that's, that's all attached to this same worship thing. Going again here in this, uh, I believe, Italian example of the light bringer and uh, how she has broken the chains. See the length of chain in her hands and she holds it out as if to say, see, I have overcome. And uh, of course, this is a female entity. Uh, this has all been ruined because the Bible has nothing but men in it and women are just, you know, fodder or whatever. And so, you know. Mankind ruined this a little bit here, uh, and it ran through all of Europe and eventually got that feeling going. And now we've come back from that. It's taken us damn near 2,000 years to come back from that whiplash of bullshit that we got from that Hebrew God. But let's uh, look at that chain thing. She's got our Statue of Liberty has chains. Her feet are chained. Yeah, her feet are chained, and she's got... Uh, Weird looking feet too. I mean, I remember them from the, uh, from Ghostbusters. Remember when they get into it and do their thing? And uh, she said one of her feet's like this big old club foot looking thing too. The other one kind of looks normal with a normalish sandal on it, and then one is this big old foot here. But this doesn't have the chain. Let me show you a picture of that. She's chained. So yeah, this is like her feet area and stuff, and you can see that right here she's chained, and it runs up through her dress and out back over here and around. And it's, uh, one of the links is supposed to be broken, but it's not in this depiction here than the original. And also, way over here, there's that ugly club foot. Oh my gosh, you got a big old foot. But, uh, yeah, it's 
not like men feed on a woman or something. They made her somewhat androgynous, I guess, to try to appease some of the people that thought this would be a male deity, that it just a uh, guy with long hair, kind of a Jesus thing. But let's go on. Let's, let's see if we can find that broken chain. Yeah, we can find it right down here. There you can see that there it is in the broken link that's there at the end of the chain where it's popped loose from it. And now we are broken loose from our freedom. This is, I guess, to signify our freedom. And uh, France gave this to us uh, to give light to the ships that were coming to France to come over. And that would be a beacon of light to let them know that, hey, it was all there. And they knew they had given us this. So we were all cool with them, with the French immigrants and things like that. This is having to do uh, with after that we would still be cool with them after the fact that we did the Louisiana purchase and things. But I digress. Let's go back to Mithra or other examples of this iconography and surely we see the symbolism in Columbia pictures you know through Sony and and that that right there is their depiction of again Lady Liberty and uh, District of Columbia is Washington DC so this tries to tie it all together but you can see also how she's bringing the light so surely when we see something like this, we can see the uh, instant connection to it and in this in being the Indian deity and the uh, arm has been broken off now, but uh, quite often it is a light bearer also as a cup bearer, which also attaches you to revelations if you're familiar. And so you get this variation on and uses a protector quite often and graves on uh, you know mortuaries and sites like that as being that the, that he will be the protector of you that he the the son himself the son Saul Invictus will be a caretaker and a judge somehow like blending together of the Greeks and Romans you get Helios being blended in and now you can see it here that Helios is this same entity and that's why they drew it in they were trying to draw in a religion to see if they could make it all one empire and they found that the religion was what was holding them apart because there was so much dogma in their religions and it was their way that they mended with Greece, and they found that to be fantastic. So they thought, why don't we do it all over? So they started usurping other people's thoughts and deals. That's the reason that you see uh, so much symbolism in the Catholic Church today and all the paganism that they have and how they adopt it in the pagans. They just simply say that what we do is we Christianize it, if you will, or Catholicize it, and then it becomes their own little holiday. But Maybe it turns out that Catholics are actually worshiping everybody else's stuff all at once, huh? And you can see in these earlier depictions how he's a, a ruler, and uh, he's back to holding a ruler, and uh, the the sun rays coming out of his eye, um, top of his head, and and uh, he's shining forth from, you know, himself. He's the sun god, uh, very much uh, like Shamash. In many depictions, he's always there assisting, giving rulership and judgment whenever a king is receiving the circle of power or the, uh, you know, the me, um, and uh, in this case, um, a Persian deity. And you can see here how he's, again, a man with the divine ruler that's here, helping to oversee the divine judgment. And so kings of yore were all indoctrinated into the church by the fact that this um, entity was overseeing it and it was his divine judgment. You can see here the knights and the age that we're talking about and how this still is in effect. So this would be way after Christianity has started, but not procured, and it's still not Christian. It's Mithraism. Quite often he's depicted as an overseer, like the sun, you know, that's always looking down upon you. Kind of that Santa Claus thing, kind of like what we believe about God and Jesus now. Um, in this depiction here, you can see definite Phrygian caps are on these guys here. And this is meant to be Hermes with his Cadacious. 
actually causing something to happen. This looks like an Amphalos, perhaps, like a, one of those um, um, belly buttons of the earth that the oracles use. And interestingly here, we do have a triad up in heaven. And uh, so and there's a female entity involved in it too. But in this depiction, he, she looks male, no boobies. But this is definitely a female in the moon. So here we have a Nana. That's the female moon goddess and the sun. And they are the ones together with their child. So, by the way, the uh, female entity in this is equated with a Mother Earth and or Mother Goose. And you can see how she has taken control of the lamb and the bull and uh, over the waters. It would be Aquarius. Here is the serpent dragon face that is showing throughout here with the wings hanging down as a woman. This is Lucifer, the morning star, Venus. And then here is Mother Goose. Uh, yeah, instead of a cabbage patch, these people thought that swans and geese brought babies. They somehow for a little while had that attached into it, but an incredible relief here where she's the mother and giving her children fruits and um, the mother of all the uh, the big symbolism that's with that. In earliest depictions, he's just shown as being uh, radiantly naked and that he uh, is wearing a Phrygian cap still at this point. But he's somewhat of a war god, and he is the bringer of light, carrying the torch. Now, if you look, he's coming up over a rock. And this is the Shamash thing. And this is where they're counting the days, and where the sun is coming up over certain hills, mountains, rocks, things like that. So it's a calendar deity, a calendar entity equating the sun and putting it all together at this point. And oddly enough, you always see him sacrificing this bull. I'm just going to show you a collage here, but you can see how he's sacrificing this bull. And whenever he does sacrifice the bull, how the snake is involved. There's a dog, quite often a goat. And uh, so here he is sacrificing a bull. In this, and in all these pictures, I want you to note how his legs are in the same position, that he's in the same position. Now he pulls the bull's head up and stabs it. He pulls the bull's head up and stabs it. You see this. Pulls the bull's up, stabs it in here. Same thing. Legs in this position. What is it with this leg position? Well, let me show you. And one of the keys to finding the constellation connection between this was the stars that are over there over his shoulder that are on his cloak still. And that you can still see there are a grouping of stars out over here, you know, in Taurus. And it's in this exact same motif. And here he is sitting in that same leg posture. And uh, that's it's just weird how he's always doing this leg posture. I mean, he's kneeling on a cow, but you could be doing this a bunch of different ways. Is everybody copying this one guy's picture, kind of like the Jesus thing? Or is there more to it? Well, I found out there's more to it. Okay, and this is a famous fresco that's been done here that uh, shows that same leg posture for some reason without the knees. And I keep seeing it in a few different pictures, but we'll utilize this one right here to show you what that uh, what it actually takes or what it, what, what it means and what it does. Um, they all have this similar posture. These are the three magi, the three wise men. And they show you here that uh, they're connected to, let's use this guy right here as a good example see his legs and his stature and how it looks like a big K and then that's actually Taurus. Taurus has the Pleiades down here by his feet. There's the Pleiades and how that applies to Mithra is that it contains this same representation right here and so it is giving you the depiction of Taurus and ironically he's killing Taurus in the actual um, pictures uh, or uh, statues that they have of him and and this is what gave us the hint that he's always in that thing always in that same posture and so that posture actually equates here to the sign of Taurus notice how both of these are shown with that Phrygian cap 
they also contain a green cloak. It's something that uh, really has to do with the Mithra religion, where this is the colors that he sports and everything. So they're actually trying to say that he's one of the three wise men, people are saying. And I'm, no, 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 he's not one of the three wise men. He's the sun. He's the sunshine. And the sunshine is not one of the three wise men necessarily, unless you want to say it's the sun, the moon, and the stars that came and visited. And there's a good hint of uh, what they're trying to insinuate. But, but really, the three wise men are actually something different. And as mentioned in one of my little vids that I do here, um, the actual true birth date of Christ was actually September 11th. I figured that out through long, exhausting work, and then I was... Looking through my tablets, people, I was sitting there knowing that I see it, saw that number before. I saw it in Egyptian things or something. I was looking through, and yeah, I found it in the Egyptian things. But right whenever I saw it on the piece of paper, and I looked at the word September 11th, whenever I saw it in the Egyptian stuff I had written, I realized in that one second there, all of a sudden, oh, September 11th. And then it just dawned on me. That's why they did the two pillars right there. That's why they killed the Asherah pillars on Christ's birthday. That's what that was about. This is the way the sky would be depicted at uh, Christ's birth, and you can see how the conjunctive planets come down through, and uh, Jupiter and uh, is in Virgo, and the sun and the moon are there, and it looks like she births the sun, and because it's over the, the actual constellation itself. So they say it's clothed in it or whatever, and um, it actually comes from her tummy and goes right out between her legs. So this is the birth of the sun from Virgo. And uh, it's a real lot of... Can this only happens about every 7,000 years. And although I, they say that, but then again, it happened 2,000 years ago, plus a few. And uh, apparently the last time it happened was this event, 3 BC, September 11th. And it's fiction to happen September 23rd of this year, which scares the hell out of me. This is the actually con the conjunctive that I was, where each year as the sun comes down into its lowest point on the sky per day, that it dies on December 21st. Uh, in other words, it doesn't go any lower, but it also doesn't come back up. And it hesitates for three days and then starts to rise again. And it does so right near a constellation called, called the Southern Cross. So ancient Gnostics, somewhere 300-400 B.C., mentioned the fact that the sun dies on December 21st, hung on the cross, and three days later it will rise again. This is the symbolicness inside of the zodiac and the way that the processions of stars work to understand our seasons. And it has been twisted into an odd thing that we have now as a people, but understand that the idea of Jesus is the idea that the sun goes to its lowest point in the winter, gets rebirthed, and then comes back. Easter is the equinox point whenever... It starts to get lighter and lighter and lighter. The sun comes up higher and higher and higher. And at Easter, the equinox, now light overtakes darkness through the summer. It starts again back in the winter time. Whenever you come into winter and you go into like Halloween and the Festival of Samhain, it reaches its lowest point coming into December 21st. He dies three days later. He's resurrected after having been on the cross. This is where we get this from. In fact, this Southern Cross actually does this circular dance around the Southern Celestial Pole as it does each year around. And you can see as it comes around in November and December, it ends up being right into that position, just a little left of center at the bottom where you see December at. And that is the delineation that shows up where Orion runs down through. Um, that star of Sirius and down to there. So it the sun comes down, gets hung on the cross, then goes back up and here rises. This cross goes back down and it flips and goes in circles. Another place that you can get this three days risen type effect out of and clay tablets found in Mesopotamia, modern day Iraq, 
do reveal the most important god of the time was Sin, the moon. And Sin, the moon, actually does do something odd where the moon will go to being a dead moon as it becomes less and less a sliver. Then after two extra days, it starts to be a new moon and being resurrected out of it. And there's a lot of people that put the resurrection to being something like that because the moon had to do with it and that uh, the sun shines on the moon. So it's a reflection of the moon and the reflection of is like the sun of, if you will, and that they tried to equate this to it. I still think it really has to do just with the sun, but I wanted to show you this interesting effect where you get the other zodiacal idea that the, the death and resurrection stories for uh, Jesus and everything ends up coming from this story and from the um, sun going down to its lowest point during December 21st through 25th, and that's where we celebrated that. That's actually the reason for it. It's actually the rebirth of the sun, not the sun. I don't know if you could tell the difference there. No, no one can. Latin was built for that reason, actually. Egyptians have this same relief done in Sinmut's tomb, where it actually shows you a bull phallic symbol going across the top, which would have been the Pleiades, and uh, Ryan's belt here, a lining through to where the sun would be at. And that this star of the gods comes in and denotes are this guy pointing towards that point. And that shows you that the new age comes. And here how all the gods came to see the new age. And there are even depictions in South America where it actually shows us this Orion and it's offsetting this. A lot of people didn't catch this for years and years off of it. This is a bowl that they find, a ceremonial bowl. And you can see how it's been cut out. So this thing isn't going to hold any water. Well, it's not really for holding water at all. It's for knowledge. And you can see these guys sitting here. It looks like they've got some kind of breathing device stuck in front of their faces. Whatever that has to do with anything. They're controlling these little discs they have with their hands. There's the sign of the crosses in here that are squared off crosses, which is a Christianity sign from way back when. They show a raccoon in the symbol here, and I don't know what the raccoon has to do with it unless it, it's a lunar creature, okay? And so you can get this little dot that's on his stomach there, and I believe that what we're looking at is the opposite, or flipped upside down, if I could flip this picture, of Orion lining up with Sirius the raccoon, I guess, and doing its thing. You can see how the depiction shows the slight offness of it, and then over here how you have that same offness of it. So, now, that center of the raccoon is Ra, a symbol, the sun god. But in doing so, I don't know where they get the raccoon thing from. I had no idea raccoon symbolized this to South American people, but I'll look into that. Raccoons may have a lot more to do with anything. That bandit-looking little weasel? Yeah. You can actually find this matchup that's going on, even into ancient Turkey and the Arata region, where you can find this coin and it utilizing the lion and the stars along with it showing you that on it it has the stars and above it are the three stars that are offset of Orion now this dates this thing too because you have to go back quite some thousands of years to end up having this actual depiction that shows on this thing here and it's with Nimrod Dagai so this actually equates Nimrod and Dagon together in at the same time at this place this is uh, another coin from 385 BC, and uh, on the right side you can see the swan, the fish, it says the word map, and then it has uh, the ankh down there below the uh, bird uh, of life. And uh, on the left here you can see the Ahura Mazda depiction of him carrying the sun disc, and you notice how he has the angel iconography, and where this comes from. As for hundreds of years now, he's had this iconography of being this angel that carries things, a divinity, a under God that does this type of thing. So that's where you get that from. And so at one time, somewhere around six, 700 BC here, um, they owned a territory that delved way down into India and uh, way up here into the north and west 
and uh, it looks a little sketchy up there, but they can find remnants of them, temples, things that uh, just literally point to them. But also something interesting to note, they had also gotten into Egypt at the time down here at the bottom. And uh, so they're definitely going down through there also. Um, it also shows that they come all the way out into the Thai area that they even had a stronghold at, for a good long time in the edge of it and up here in the top and this would be Mongolia right here people so um and so they may have had a lot to do with the Mongols I don't know if they had blue eyes mixed with them or not or anything and if there's any blue-eyed Asians or Chinese, but if they are, it's generally because of that. Now, I did a special on Sumerians that are over there, and they, they have blue eyes in a lot of their statues, too. I'll, I'll show you a picture of how the blue eyes that come from the Sumerians, you know, they basically come from right here. These Sumerians end up spreading out through everywhere. And this ironically looks just like the map that they have of how the Cro-Magnon man spread out through the continents from out of Africa. And the Afri out of Africa model, they really show that it starts right in here somewhere and it spreads both ways, actually three ways. And this all relates back to Mithra and Mithra who is the, the reborn sun god of up to 1200 BC and actually it looks like it's coming close to 2100 BC when you would have this actual revelation because the equinoxes process every about 2160 years and if this was showing him killing Taurus and leading into the next age then that would have been 2600 years before Christ whatever it showed up right before Aries I guess you would say, and so it would be heralding the season of Aries by killing off the bull. And, uh, you know, there's just too many striking resemblances here where the thing, you know, A, it looks like Statue of Liberty, but then it's uh, born on December 25th, had 12 disciples, performed miracles, dead for three days, resurrected. Yeah, interestingly, they have Sunday worship with the Sunday. It was written for Saul Invictus Sunday. It's what we worship on today. And if you find in the Bible, the Sabbath is actually Saturday. And that's because they were worshiping Saturn, the guy that kills and eats his own children. And uh, that's where you get the um, Hebrew idea and a lot of these ancient people back there idea that you were supposed to eat your firstborn and all these weird things that they were doing back then is through this type of representation. This small list right here is just some of the important ones and it gets people's eyes to go, what? But uh, again, on the way out of this video, I'm going to show you um, what they did on that game show and the list that's actually there, that he was um, an immortal god that was reborn on earth as a mortal to do his works for us. He had the halo on his head, the whole nine yards to go with that. And that's where we get the halo depiction from, is, is from this type of thing here. And it grows into that. So let's look at that last video on the way out. And when we find who Christ really is, this man, Mithra. During India, there are amazing things claimed about Mithras, and I'll read you some of them. He was a savior, Mithras, sent to earth to live as a mortal, through whom it was possible for sinners to be reborn into an immortal life. He died for our sins, but came back to life the following Sunday. He was born of a virgin on December the 25th in a manger, or perhaps a cave, attended by shepherds, and became known as the light of the world. He had 12 disciples with whom he shared a last meal before dying. His devotees symbolically consumed the flesh and blood of him. Because Mithras was a sun god, he was worshipped on Sundays. Is he a tribute band? He <laughs> 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 with a halo around his head. And Mithras gave each other gifts on December the 25th. The leader of the religion was called the Papa, and uh, HQ was on Vatican Hill in Rome. And you're not you're kind of writing up the chat, and it's just, just a massive coincidence. <laughs> Yeah, just a massive coincidence, yeah. Yeah, just a massive coincidence. And you'd say that, well, they've got to be copying them and stuff and everything. Yeah, yeah, you'd agree that somebody's copying somebody. When you find out Mithras is peaked at about 300 B.C. before any of the Christ things. And uh, 
it actually came out of the sun god Shamash and the Babylonian uh, aspects of things that just really starts to you know make you wonder it's from the Ahura Mazda strain and things you can find that him and all, all through the Zoroastrianism and things like that that people do try to equate that comes about um, and equates to being you know the the bringer of that or where they must have just kifed most of it from surely we got some difference they go uh-uh we do we do this we yeah whatever uh, the, the basis of it the rest of it you know